What's up boys and girls, Lambu here, and today's video will be very special because this is gonna be a one of a kind, well maybe I'm gonna make a second version of it uh, once I have more stuff to talk about, but today is gonna be a common misconceptions video, so stuff that I very often see other people say wrong about StarCraft, um, it, it might be on forums, it might be in Twitch chat, in the YouTube comments, wherever really, just things that I very often see um, just that are straight up wrong for some reason and people spread this misinformation so I wanted to clear up a couple of them uh, because it, it, it sometimes annoys me so first things first this one I, I, I tried clearing up very very often Jagannatha is not actually a large map so it's not a massive map the rush distance on Jagannatha is not that long as you can see here I'm hitting, I'm hitting this hatchery at the beginning of 153 this is actually the third best map for any for any 12 pools or any early game aggression out of all the maps. So Submarine and Lightshade are the only two maps that are shorter. Oxide is larger, Death Aura is larger, Pillars is larger, Romanticide is also a little bit larger, so... Jaganatha is not that big. The, the reason why Terran specifically don't like it, uh, it comes from comes from a couple of different things, but like the rush distance, especially also from Terrans that have their army here and then they try to pressure this fort base. It's really freaking short, actually. This is n this is nothing like an ice and chrome or something what we had in the, in the, in the past. I, f I already forgot the other ice map, but we we had a bunch of way bigger maps. So the reason this map is not that great is because expansions are very very exposed. The, the map in general is very open, speed zones are better for melee units than they are for marines that need to split. And there's a lot of bases where you don't really expand as much towards the Terran, so a lot of, you're gonna see a lot of Zergs take this as their fourth base, or this, rather than this. So th this map has a couple of things going for it that makes it good against Terran, but please, the size is not one of them. Okay, let's get on to our next point. All right. So before I before I say my second point, I just wanted to say real quick that you guys can check on um, Liquipedia, so on wiki.teamliquid.net. You guys can simply check the map rush distances. So if this ever happens, like on the next map pool, and this video is not accurate anymore, like when, when there is new maps out, you can, you guys can literally see the rush distance there. It says it. So don't be confused about the map uh, the map's rush distance. Usually, what I do on day one is I check it with the twelve pools. The reason Dragonatha is a little bit faster than uh, Romanticide is because you can also micro around the or into the speed zone a little bit. So because of that, it's a little bit faster than Romanticide, but it's definitely one of the shorter maps. Okay, the next thing that I see all the freaking time is that people think the Zerg late game, st still people think the Zerg late game is strong and they can have their own opinion about whether the Zerg late game is broken or strong or whatever, but stop saying Vipers can abduct units of Protoss one by one. That's such bullshit. Um, I made all the relevant units, um, very often I see, well, but uh, can't one player just zone out the High Templars and then abduct the units one by one? That's, that's like impossible basically. The, the reason you see Rodos players get their units abducted is because they're, one, not looking at their units because they're distracted, two, if they do not anticipate the Corruptors from the right direction, which shouldn't happen in late late game because they ha should be focused on constantly revelating uh, their army. So, so that's second. And third is just because they're not good at uh, moving their army. A lot of people say there is not much to do with Protoss in, in late game and that's why they're bad. That's also... Protoss late game is not actually that easy to play. You need a lot of different hotkeys. You need uh, preferably a hotkey for the mothership because its turn rate is very, very bad, as you can see here. That's why it gets abducted so often. But it has quite a quite a big cloak uh, field, so it doesn't actually need to be that close from their units. As you can see now, it loses it. But every time I click on the other side, and unless you you click it straight away, like if you if you click anywhere else, it takes a huge turn. So the turn rate is not great of this unit, right? That's why it's flying circuits here. The best thing you can do is turn it like this. But in general, having a hotkey would be important. You also, in theory, should have a hotkey for oracles. P probably also war prisms. You can even put high templars in war prisms uh, against ultra compositions if you don't have any immortals. Stuff like that. There's so much that the Protoss can do um, that makes controlling the army quite difficult. So one common misconception is that Protoss late game is just simply a move plus storm. That is probably true for the lower leagues, but on higher level, this is not entirely the case. But the main, the, my main point was about the Vipers. The Viper abduct range is 9. The feedback, the feedback range is 10. So first of all, 
the High Templars outrange the Vipers, right? So if I abduct a unit that's right on top of a High Templar and the High Templar presses feedback, I, I, I can't see it right now, but the, the Viper would get feedback before anything happens. And now the thing is that so, so people think, wow, but can't the Lurker just run up here and outrange the other unit? No, that's because the Protoss air units have enough range to just kill it then. And at the same time, this is not an instant damage. So, so Lurkers also have 10 range. So the same as the feedback. So you can feedback a unit and then go back and the High Templar doesn't even get hit. You can obviously also sidestep and you need to hit it with multiple Lurkers at the same time. So it's not actually that easy to just abduct units. First of all, you also need vision range. So the Lurker can't really be ahead of the sport to begin with. So usually the poking battle is, is, is the thing that should go towards the Protoss. The best zoning ability from Zerg is the Fungal because it actually outranges the Tempest. It has the same range as the Tempest. Tempest anti ground has 10 range. Fungal also has 10 range, but it has a uh, um, radius on top of that. So if, if I try to hit this and the Infestor is here, I can Fungal and then I can try to dive on the Protoss units. That's why Protosses are using shield batteries. But you can't just simply abduct units from my own. That's such bullcrap. You can have your I Templars always in between your air units and the Zerg's uh, air units and it is actually going to be very very easy to zone those out on top of that every single time you even approach if your army is revealed or if the process vision at all you will lose one of your units to tempest if tempest are involved also carriers a lot of people don't notice so i just wanted to point this out the moment they start firing at your corruptors and you're abducting units so if you're abducting too slowly or you're trying to abduct too many carriers at once they can just focus fire their vipers because carriers after they release their interceptors they go from 8 range to 14 uh, so that's their leash range of of, of the interceptors, which means if, the, let's say, the, vi the Viper is standing here, right? So in order to attack the Spore, the carrier must be this close. But then after, you you, can, you see that these interceptors are still attacking this Viper, even though, even though the carrier is super far away, right? So this is how ranges work. You can't simply abduct units one by one. Realistically, it's always going to happen, but especially in very, very late game, or if both players play perfect, which which obviously is never going to happen, but in very very late game where there are not not that many distractions, abducting units doesn't actually happen as much. Even if you if you put your vipers, let me show you this one real quick as well. If you put your vipers together with okay, that's way too many vipers. Um, with a lot of overseers, I'm not sure why I just made ravagers. So let's say I have I have these all on the same hotkey, right? And the Protoss army is here. You see how the Mothership turned back, by the way, because I don't have it on a, on, on a separate hotkey. So this is where the Mothership gets um, gets abducted. But every time you have your units like this, the, the Protoss can zone with Storm while going back, plus obviously shooting. So even if you're going to get um, abducts, you're, at the same time you're going to eat a shit ton of damage. So th that's what the Protoss can do. He also can try to feedback. In general, all the Protoss really needs to do is having the High Templars in front. Um, Zerg doesn't really have units that can catch very well. You would need like a Fungal plus the Lurkers in order to catch the High Templars, which is actually not that easy. Also, you can split off your High Templars, believe it or not, and just have a couple in front of your units. Uh, but all of this stuff is advanced. I just hate when when people on, on, on Reddit or on, on any forum say Zerg can just abduct units one by one and win slowly. Like, that's... Complete nonsense because of the way that ranges work. Like, uh, Spore Crawler has 7 range, Fungal has 10 range, that's your best tool. Abduct, 9 range, Feedback, 10 range, Tempest has 14 and 10 range, so it's not like Brute Lords can zone out the High Templars either. Anyways, let's get on to the next point. Okay, so the third point is something a little bit more matchup, also matchup specific, so not the ZVP, but this time ZVT. Very, very often, I, I see people writing really weird comments when it comes down to pure Ling Bane style. As if... Some, some, sometimes they say it's a greedy style, sometimes they think the players are trolling if they stay on Ling Bane only. And I just wanted to clear up that Ling Bane is a style that has been around for so long now, and is the opposite of greedy. It is the safest style you can play because you have the most amount of units. The idea behind it is that you require less gas, so you have more fighting units. The lack of Hydras or Mutas behind it does not make your army weaker in direct fights. So that's 
actually the complete opposite they are the way people understand this from the reason why zerg players are playing it the reason why zerg players are playing it is because it's extremely strong against tanks and very very often if you see zerg players fall behind this is the style that they tend to go because it's the easiest one to survive with because with the lowest amount of drones you can still have the highest amount of units since you don't require as much gas so usually what you can do is you can just mass queens go ling bane try to go for a counter attack and then hold at home something like that to come back in a game in general it is fantastic and it's um, against tank timings it's also very very common on short maps it's great against Aatrax for example um, it, the weaknesses of the style are just constant widow mines and the fact that you don't have solid anti-air so the, the fact that you do, can't really clean up medevacs easily and the Terran can get a lot of value out of his stuff but you can force Terrans away from the widow mines since you now can transition from Ling Bane into Lurker this is not greedy going Ling Bane into Lurker it's just normal um, so people, please don't misunderstand this. Um, just because Zerg has less tech units does not mean that they're greedy or that it's um, unconventional. It's actually a style that we, has been around since forever. So don't the next time you see uh, one of your one of your Terran streamers lose against Ling Bang, don't ask them, hey, this guy was out trolling you. I can't believe it that you lost against that. It's completely fine. It's a completely fine style to play. All right, up to the next point. So the next point is about ZVZ. Uh, very often I get misquoted because I call people clowns, specifically the Korean ZVZ, and people think that... I I think that the perfect way to play ZVZ is to just play macro every game and standard and always go roach. First of all, all ins are not what I mean with when I, when I say Koreans are playing like clowns. This has nothing... one has nothing to do with the other. What I mean by that, or what I meant by that in past interviews, is that they sometimes play absolute nonsense. So they would go for all-ins that hit so late that at this point you can hold it with no matter what you're doing. So reactively, even if you missed, missed a scout and then you can hold something, then that means the build is not good. And the style for me is a, is a clown style or he plays like a clown. Or uh, another example is that they just in general they would float gas before they take the lair. In 2000, um, 2019, pretty much every single game they played ZVZ. And they would just go for stuff that makes very little sense. So all-ins themselves are not what I consider playing like a clown because there are tight all-ins that you need to scout in order to hold. Those are good. Those are needed to be mixed in. Otherwise, your opponent can blind counter you by going super greedy or muta every game, even on maps where muta is not exactly safe. So I think all-ins in general are important to mix in, but um, there are some other things that the Zerg players can do, for example, where they would go for a super late upgrade and then they try to hit a plus one melee all-in by the time where the opponent can easily just have a wall and all you need to do, let's, let's say there's still a Roach Warren here, you have a Queen here, and then if you have 60 Zerglings super late, with a couple of banelings, it doesn't matter because you, you can't engage with the zerglings against any amount of baneling queen. So your zergling count doesn't matter, so why wouldn't you just have all in earlier, just as, as, as an example. Or there are all ins that are like, some people go 13-12 instead of 12-11, and then go go for a ling baneling all ins that you can defend easily while making 10 different mistakes. Dude, this is clown style. Or going for very, very weird two base gambles. So, for example, Rogue recently against Rainer played um, Rainer played a two base opener and Drogue went for Ling Bane all in against it, which is not supposed to work against literally any two base opener. So that's complete nonsense, right? So this is what I this is what I'm talking about with also the other Zerg pros when we're making fun of other people's CVZ, sometimes also of ourselves, because we also tend to play like clowns from every now and again. Um, so I just wanted to to clear up any confusion there. And then the next point for which we can simply stay in this replay is Cyril's big weakness is Muta. Cyril is specifically bad against Muta. This is what a lot of people think, and everyone thinks that we're abusing that. It's not so much that Cyril is bad against Muta, I think there isn't a single player that uh, wants to play Muta against someone that's uh, as good as him, while you're just the one playing defensive Roach. It's just that Muta is incredibly difficult to play against, and incredibly easy to play as the Muta player on very high level. And I actually think that Cyril is probably the single best player against Muta in, in normal games. I saw Rogue playing some really slick games against Muta, but sometimes he also just dies when I when I when I watch him play against Muta. So 
it, 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 it's it's either one of those two i believe but um you just can't afford any mistakes so you will very often see see players uh, fall behind and fall apart against mutalisks this has nothing to do with serial personally this is just a, a general thing of zvz this is literally the reason why you see so many zergs all in if muta wasn't so strong and you anyone literally any pro, pro player would be confident uh, in going up standard against muta you would just open standard every game because the standard beats most of the all-ins relatively easily but if you want if you go up standard against a guy that goes muta um I, I don't know a single player that's super confident in dealing with it on most maps right there there are sometimes maps where there are only two entrances to each base or sometimes maps are super short where you're like okay now i can just attack and kill him uh so like no one's gonna go link main mute on submarine for example but in general it's not so much serial that's weak against Mira, it's just Mira that's super strong against standard macro styles. And serial also himself is mixing a lot of all-ins, so it's not even specifically good against serial because he doesn't all-in anymore. Or that, that, they, does he all, that he always plays macro. So it's a comp like, that's just Mira is hard to play against, period. Not serial is weak against Mira, not uh, Rainer is doing Mira because of that. Mira, he's doing Mira because it's a, it's a, great uh, great thing to do also it's a lot easier to win as the worst player if you're going from muta rather than roach versus roach so that's the reason we're doing it right um so so um that was my next point okay let's go on to the next one okay so this one will be very easy to explain and hopefully very fast as well um very often i see people saying that when a zerg skips zergling speed in zvz and goes for a two base layer because he rushes tech and because he skips link speed and i see this so often it's incredible by obviously lower level players i think most casters know this but um this, so this is mostly a lower level misunderstanding going for a two base wall of build is the safest thing you can do it doesn't matter if you rush a layer and aspire it doesn't matter, matter if you rush a layer and road speed i couldn't care less if you made a fucking infestation pit of two bases if you open two base with a wall off you cannot die against Link Floods, nor can you die against Link Banolins. It's the safest possible opening, but don't mistake the the skip of the early speed plus an early tech for a greedy opener, because that's just not the case, okay? Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's get on to the next one. Okay, my final point of this video is the one that I am most passionate about, and this one will be that the better player does not always win. Doesn't matter what uh, what what type of series it is. It can be a best of one, three, five, seven, nine. Um, I don't really care about how many games there are. There are a lot of factors that factor into the outcome of a series. A lot of games are decided by strategy. A bunch of them are decided by like split split second decision making. Some are like by one massive error. Like, uh, for example, uh, Hellions running in and killing everything because you didn't look for a second, or a Zergling run by getting in, or you didn't micro your Marines and everything died to Banelings, or your Protoss and you missed the forest field and then all of a sudden an early game run by came in, anything like that. There's also just straight up strategy wins, which might happen like once in a time, which doesn't mean that you're strategically the better player necessarily over the course of more and more games. Um, one thing that people can argue for is that the player that plays better always wins, but I'm not even sure that I would agree with that. Um, I guess a couple of examples um, that I that I could come up with. There, there's a lot of examples of like uh, Korean players losing the rematch of the guy that they beat first in the GSL style format. In Korea, a lot of the players can just on a good day beat other players and they all beat each other they're all very similar in skill level so even one of the better koreans can lose against the worst korean sometimes you see like the guys that just win a tournament just completely bum out in the in in, in the next gsl group stage I, I remember being furious that team liquid had a, a su as a power ranking number one after he won katowice i think if you even just looked at those games I could feel that Sue wasn't actually the, the the greatest. He barely made it out of the group stage, but then he won what was it like four or three best of fives and a best of seven, and because of that, all of a sudden he's now the best player. No, he just lost the GSL like immediately after in the first group stage. Um, maybe s some more recent tournament results. Uh, Bian beat Cyril in the in the Asus rock, right? And then he looked to be on fire again in TSL. 
what happened? He lost 3-0. Does it mean now that Cyril is now better, but before Bian was better? No, not really. I think you need to look at the greater picture to decide how good a player really is. So this argument of, hey, he beat him, he's now better, is, is pretty much just nonsense. Um, another example that I can think of is a laser beat Rainer 3-0 in, in the latest TSL. And then uh, last week they played um, in the EPT Cup, or this week I think even it was, and Rainer won 3-0 after losing 3-0, where he actually was practicing back then as well, to now where he just came back from a break and he hasn't been playing as well, he then beat Elazer 3-0. So does that mean that back then Elazer was the better player? No, absolutely not. Um, Elazer won very much so on the strategic, uh, strategic place, which means he played the series better than his opponent, absolutely no doubt. But uh, one series alone never shows who the better player is. It can show that, you, you can get a general picture of it. If I'm playing a best of seven against Clem and he's 4-0-ing me in standard macro games where he doesn't get far ahead in the early game, you guys can see, hey, this guy is better than me. But you need to look at the games themselves. Uh, you can't just pick a series and then say, okay, this guy is better because you're just looking at the result. That makes very little sense in my head. And then the second point is, I, th I, I believe it's fair to say that the, the player that plays better wins the game. But um, I, I, want, I want you guys to be the judge of that and tell me your opinion, because I'm going to give you guys an example. I'm playing a game against Clem, and the moment he flies out with his first two Medivex, and he also leaves his base with all the Hellions, I get a Ling run by in, and I kill 30 SCVs, so the game is practically over. But it's TVZ, so it goes on. He starts multitasking, and for the next five minutes straight, I keep making mistakes, he keeps finding hole in my defense. Yo always kills drones and then picks up his marines and he just outplays me for the next five minutes at which point i'm like okay you know f it let's just go and attack with hydra bane the units that i have right now and i barely win the game because of how far ahead i was did i really play better than him that game really he made a massive error which would be to to move out with all of his units and then afterwards I kind of played worse for him for like five minutes straight so i played better than him for a very short amount of time and then he played better than me for the rest so who's really the better player this same thing can be said about a lot of matchups and in a lot of scenarios like uh, protoss doesn't look at a bailing drop from two sides loses 40 probes and then for the rest of the game uh, plays a super clean game it doesn't really matter anymore at that point and it's very hard to judge who the better player is also often as a viewer you have no idea how good um like if they're misclicking a lot this is something that the pros and mostly will be able to resonate with like sometimes your supply block the viewers have they don't see the supply blocks they also don't see your misclicks they don't see that it takes you longer than usual to put your three three drones into gas maybe all of a sudden you have five drones in gas and then you take an extra couple of seconds and you feel like you're playing worse in that specific day so so players can also have bad days right so it's very hard to judge players from from their performance and specifically just from looking at the results that's all i wanted to say the better player has not always win in StarCraft, even though it's a super skill-based game. And it has very little luck involved, obviously. So yeah, that's it for the last point of me. I was very passionate to make this video because there's a couple of things that sometimes I get asked on my Twitch, and I don't want to repeat the same thing over and over again because I don't want to be super repetitive on stream, and I also don't really want to get annoyed or be offensive to the people that ask me this in all seriousness. So I decided to make this video that I can refer them to and i hope you guys enjoyed it if you guys uh disagree with anything you can let me know in the comments if you guys like this kind of stuff which is just a one time off video like it's not uh, as, as serious like my other videos uh you can leave it a like you can tell me if you like the content overall you can obviously subscribe to my channel and that's it for this video i hope you guys are all well and i will see you in the next video bye bye